Good morning, good day, and welcome to those of you that are in this room and those of you that are joining us from around the world, wherever you're joining us from at this time, to be a part of this moment. Um, it's unique because of who God is, and I hope that each and every one of you that are, I would even say in this room, and that those of you that are watching and those of you that are listening, to a certain degree, you will be able to understand that statement that I'm making. One thing I know, if you're not born again, you will never get it. And I know that we have um, a lot of people based on our church is set up today because I've said it before and when I said it people take offense but I don't care when I speak the truth and you're offended take it up with God take it up with God when I look at the scriptures the Old Testament the prophets never speak to sinners they never speak to the Canaanites they never speak to the Amalekites they never speak to the Jebusites or the Girgashites or the whatever ites that was around them. They were sent to Israel, God's people, God's covenant people. So when Israel needed to understand what God's timing and season and whatever God wants them to come into, he would send the prophets, as it is said in Amos chapter 3, that Surely the Lord will do nothing until he first reveal it to his prophets, his servants. So when the Lord speaks, the prophet speaks and speak only to Israel. When I look at the New Testament, Jesus Christ himself, God manifesting in the flesh. And we saw in Matthew chapter 15, when the woman came, uh, the, the Syrophoenician woman came to him concerning her daughter, and Jesus didn't pay her any attention for days. And it got to the point where the disciples were annoyed, annoyed with her constant crying after them and told Jesus to send her away. And I remember Jesus' response to her was, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because of that woman's faith, she got something that was not the time where God was concerned for her to even come into it, but because of her faith. That's why Jesus said to her, great is your faith. When we look at the New Testament going on, even in the book of Acts, and after we see the church begin to grow numerically, spiritually. The Bible talk about how the grace of God was upon the church and the fear of God and everything that was happening. It was only the church that the apostles were sent to. Today, we have a church setting where it is set that anybody can come. Anybody can come and, and people, people believe, you know, based on the culture that I need to go to church. So if they didn't go to church throughout the year, there are those who have certain special days mark on their calendar that they must be in church. Easter Sunday. Um, maybe the Good Friday. But the Easter Sunday is a big one for a lot of them. And Christmas Sunday. The others in between, you know, it's not. But, but for many, it's the Easter Sunday and the Christmas Sunday. I must be in church. And you're not born again. You don't know God. What is that about? So even in this room today, there are those who are pretending to be born again. And they have, they have been... They have been coming and going through the motion, but there's nothing happening for them. And it makes it, 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 their life, let it look like God is a liar. Their lives, let it look like God is not true. And let it look like even me is a liar. 
Because when I gave my life to the Lord at the age of 18 years old, April of 1987, just a few months after my 18th birthday, December of, of 1986, I turned 18. And 1987, April of that year, I gave my life to the Lord. And from that blessed night until this day, I continue to experience transformation. Not just change. Can you see change? You can, you know, you can change up the house, change up the furniture, change up whatever. I'm talking about transformation. That when somebody come back to the house, they said, what happened? What's going on here? Said, I did some renovation and transform move the powder room from where it was and put it in another location transformation that when the the person who normally come to us and know where the powder room when they might go they realize where's the powder room transformation that's what we experience in christ and whether you want to come into it or not you can continue to be an hypocrite and and walk into hell show up in church every sunday and walk into hell you can continue that path. There's absolutely nothing that I can do about that. Because I have no control over your will. I have no control over your will. God gave it to you for you to either choose him or reject him. Wow. God even know that you have... It, when God gave man will, he know that there was the potential for him to reject him. Yet he didn't withhold. Because in order for man to genuinely be a son of God, he had to have choice. Because you see, God chose him first. And in turn, he need to choose God. He need to choose God. You know this with our children? When did we choose them? For some of us, we plan to have a child or to have children. Not like my mother and my father. They didn't plan. My father was just, you know, looking for a fun time. And then, you know, later on my wife, my mother would tell him, I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. But there are those of us who literally plan to have children. And the moment you plan to have children... I'm sorry if, 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 if I'm hitting you with a sledgehammer today. Because a lot of you didn't plan for your children. And a lot of us, our parents never planned for us. And that's why some of us experience some of the things we experience. Because we were never planned for. In their estimation, we were unwanted. So we were rejected even from the womb. Because when your parents found out, when your mother found out that your parents said, come on, it, 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 in her, it, it, you're interrupting her life. And then she go and tell the man that she's pregnant for the man and say, what? I don't want any children. So you were double rejected. Thank God for Jesus. You see, there's a lot of healing that we come into when we are born again. We have to be healed from rejection. Rejection from our earthly parents that, is a, that should have been a representation of God, but because they didn't know God. The spirit of rejection is one of the most dangerous spirit that many of us have encountered. And some of us still, many of us who even hung around me for years, you're still plagued by that spirit. Why aren't you free? Because I used to be plagued by it. It is the spirit of rejection that opens you up to low self-esteem. It is the spirit of rejection that opens you up to inferior complex. Where you're constantly comparing yourself to other people. And realize that you can never come up to their measurement. And so you're constantly working very hard. Literally killing yourself to compare yourself to others. And when we come to Christ, 
One of the things that we must understand that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, everything that sin had done where the human was concerned, he bore that. Remember, he was rejected. He was rejected. The scripture said he was a man of sorrow and he was acquainted with grief surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows he was smitten <laughs> and when they saw all of that happening they thought that you know it was just God doing something but they didn't understand that it he was wounded for our transgression bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him so everything that Jesus bore was for us so the rejection that he experienced was to bring healing to our rejection he was rejected by his own people that he was sent to first by way of covenant remember he came unto his own and his own received him not. And then when he hung on the cross, when he hung on the cross, because in a moment he became sin. As Moses lift up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. In that moment he became sin. And remember, the dark, the sun was shaded everything where creation was concerned was in turmoil at that very moment when jesus became sin on the cross and watch this god the father turned his back on him because he had to experience what it is when we are rejected and away from god for what reason so that he can reconcile us and remember in the moment when God turned his back on him, what he, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That you and I will never be forsaken again. But yet many of us are hanging around church and we're still experiencing rejection. We're reject, experiencing inferior complex, all of those stuff. Because we're not, we don't believe. Some of us are not even born again, so we have no capacity to receive anything. You know what I'm going to encourage every single one of you that you weren't here yesterday in the meeting. And maybe you didn't have the time to watch the meeting yesterday. I'm going to encourage every single one of you. I would also encourage even those of you that were here yesterday. Those of you that watched it already. Go back and watch it again. Because many of you got baptized and were never baptized for the right reason. Some of you got baptized, you just showed up during the time. Because remember, every month, you remember every month we used to have baptism when we were at Midway. Every last Sunday there was a baptism. At least even one person were baptized. You remember? Anybody remember that? Some of you got baptized during that process. And what happened with some of you? Some of you, you were never on the list. It, the day of the baptism, you showed up. Walk up to me, go into the pool, got baptized, and you're still thinking. What you, many of you thought that when you got baptized, like some people who get married, and believe that marriage is a formula, and it's a magical formula. Because, you know, we read too much fairy tale book and watch too much Disney fairy tale. And believe that when we get married, you know, and after we walk away from the altar, and in this fairy tale movie, you see the prince and the princess ride away into the sunset. And it always ends, and they live happily ever after. <laughs> Trisha. <laughs> Shrek and Princess Fiona. That's a fairy tale. It's not real. It's not life. Marriage is a showcase. Marriage is a platform that shows off who you are. It's going to expose you. 
And so when we, especially being around someone like me, because there are many places where right now what I'm saying, it wouldn't even bother you because you would have never heard it and there is no standard. The pastor is nasty and everybody is nasty. And anything goes. And that's what I'm telling you. You better stay away from me or repent. I'm going to say it again. You better stay away from me or repent. I am a standard. As Isaiah said, I and my children, I and my family, we are a sign to Israel. You remember even Isaiah children? Every one of them, he wasn't the one that chose their name. God told him, call this one this name because this is what it means. And this is what I'm going to do to Israel. I am a standard. Be very careful. This is not a joke. Today, I'm really grateful to God for what he has been doing among us and what he will continue to do. We're going to take a couple of minutes and read together and pray together. And I pray that someone in this room and someone that may watch and listen, if you're not truly in right alignment with God, that this is the day that you will be realigned. Realigned. That, that um, I think in education, it is, it is, it is um, referred to a, a, as a, a grammatical stem. It's not a word. But when it is applied to a word, it changes the word. And it's that little, which is not a word, but it's re. It's used a lot in the Bible. Repent. Restore. Return. Replenish. The first time the word is used in Genesis, God says you're going to multiply and replenish the earth. And God constantly saying to Israel, return unto me. For you to return, it means that you were here before and you have left where you should be. And God said, return unto me and I will return unto you. <laughs> I will restore the years that the canker worm and the caterpillar and the locust have devoured. Somebody in this room today need to repent. Somebody need to return. Jesus said to the church in Ephesus, Rem remember from where you have fallen. <laughs> Repent and return to your first love. The first love that you had for God and the first love that you had for each other. Because when we're just born again, you remember when you just gone about, there's this love for God and love for people. Then all of a sudden, you get into certain things and certain trials and testing and your love start to... And God said, I'm not going to accept that. You've got to be consistent in your love that it doesn't matter what happens, you continue to love. All when them pluck out your eyes, you love the one who plucked it out. Jesus was being crucified and he was still loving those who were mocking him, those who nailed him, everything that they did to him. Out of love, he said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they have done. Forgiveness comes out of love. The reason why many of us struggle to forgive, we have no love. <laughs> God is love. 
And out of love, he forgives us. All right. Can I take a few more minutes of your time and show you something more in the scripture? Stand with me for a minute. Just waiting, just waiting, just waiting, just waiting, just waiting, 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 waiting. Thank you very much. You may take your seat. That's it. <laughs> So let me take a few more minutes, as I said, and show you something more based on what we've been looking at. I, I'm really serious about the teaching that we did yesterday. And it was a one-time teaching based on what we were doing yesterday in terms of the baptism. I did the teaching on, what was it, the, the, the title again? The what? What qualifies you for? Did you say the 14 points? Oh, I thought that's what you said, the 14 points to water baptism. <laughs> okay. And as I said, over the 37 years that I've been born again, walking with the Lord, I've seen many believers in Christ up and down. Eventually, we see many of them walk away from God. Um, some of them die in that state. Some have the opportunity to come back. Some, we don't know where they are. And one of the things that I notice is that for many people who look at the present church today, there's a lot of questions that they have. Some they ask, some they don't, but they're thinking. Because if you see, it's even some of the people that will not make a public commitment to God, they read the Bible and they know that there are certain things that if a person say that they are a believer in God, there are certain things that should be coming from your life. I, I, I believe it was um, Mahatma Gandhi who said that if he, had, if, he has, if he had ever met uh, a Christian in his life, he would believe he would give his life to Jesus or something like that, he said. Because he read the scriptures, he saw what the scripture says about Jesus, and that if you're a follower of Jesus, this is what your life should look like. And it's very sad that it has become a norm that when certain things happen in the church today, people are no longer surprised because they're, they're actually expecting it to happen. That if it doesn't happen, they're wondering, what happened? And the time has come that we cannot continue down that path. We've got to really come in true alignment with who God is and allow his plans and purposes for our life to be accomplished. In Proverbs chapter 9, 19 rather, and verse 21, many are the plans in a man's heart. The word heart there is speaking of the mind. You know that you can think a whole lot of stuff in seconds. Many are the plans in a man's mind, but is the counsel, the old King James Version says, it's the counsel of God that shall stand. I think the new King James Version and the Amplified Version, the NIV Version, it says, but it's the purpose of God that shall stand. God has a purpose for every single human being that comes into this world. It's not a religious statement. It is not a religious statement. It's a statement of truth. And when I think about my personal life and where I'm coming from, my mother having 14 of us, seven different men, the things that we went through, and how, when I look back in my life and see the things that I've gone through, I should not even be alive today. But when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ in 1987, 18 years old, it has completely transformed I mean, not just I, I, I radically changed my life. 
That if you don't even want to believe it, it doesn't change anything. I am transformed and continue to experience that. And the time has come for us to give up our religion. Because the kingdom of God is not about a religion. We have a lot of religion in the world. We have a lot of religion, Christianity included. Religion doesn't work. I'm sorry if I offend you, but the truth is the truth. Religion doesn't work. Religion doesn't have any power. Religion is bondage. You have to, watch this, you have to do whatever to do you do to keep your religion alive. But the kingdom of God does not depend on you. It is the kingdom of God, so it's dependent on God. God is the basis of it. God is the base of foundation. God is the foundation, is the authority, is the power. So when you come to the kingdom of God, it transforms you. When you come to religion, it doesn't transform you. You conform. In Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore brethren, verse 1. By the mercies of God that you present your bodies. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Which is our reasonable service. Verse 2. And be not conform to this world. Conform is that you simply adapt. Transform. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. And the image, the picture that is given when you study the word in Greek, it comes from the word that we know that is connected to a butterfly being transformed from a caterpillar, metamorpho, metamorphis. And you can relate to that. We have seen it. I have seen where the caterpillar wrap itself in that cocoon. And for days it stays there and go through the process. And it literally becomes liquid. And that liquid transform. So the nature of the caterpillar is now gone. And that which it has been transformed into. In days you see a foot start to push out. And you see this start to push out. And see a part of the wing start to push out. And if you help the butterfly you kill it. Because the butterfly need to break itself out. And in doing that it strengthen its wing. It strengthen its limbs. And come out. And later on you see that butterfly flies out. Notice the transformation that takes place. Before it transformed, what it was before you were afraid of it. You said, yuck! You want to squash it. But now what it has transformed into, you're holding out your hand. I've been to the botanical garden in, um, in the Niagara region. And when you go in and they tell you, don't touch them, don't whatever, because they're very delicate. But you will be there and they come and they, and they land on you. And you're taking picture and you're taking video. But if a caterpillar falls on you, you're not calling anybody to come and take picture with you. <laughs> Can you come and take a picture? Look, a caterpillar, a caterpillar is on me. Come, please. It falls in your head. Ah! Anybody following me here now? When you're a sinner like a caterpillar, but now that you're transformed, there's supposed to be a difference. You're no longer darkness. You are light. You are light. We're talking about the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit. And I will come back to this and dive into it a little deeper because that's very important. Many of us have the Holy Spirit, but we do not know how to receive from the Holy Spirit. I don't want to advertise, but this bottle of water, the bottle is not why you have it in front of you. You're not amazed 
buy the bottle. Oh, wow, the bottle is so nice. I want to take the bottle home. No, no, no. It's what's inside that you are concerned about. Now, you get thirsty. You have it in your position. How do you receive the water? How do you receive the water? Because it's sealed. You know, because they know that it can turn over. Something can happen. So it's sealed. How do you receive the water? You open it. And you drink. The Holy Spirit is in you. Jesus likened him to water. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. How do you receive? Because the receiving of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event. It's not a momentary thing. God intends for you and I to receive from the Holy Spirit every day. Every day. Because you and I eat food every day. Why? Don't tell me it's because you like the food. If you do, I need to pray for you. If you eat food just because you like it. I said, I'm serious. I need to take you out there and have a talk with you. <laughs> because that's not good. Because the reason why some of us don't even eat certain things that is proper for our body, we don't like it. We only choose to eat what we like, what is tasted to our mouth, and you can't do that. Marlon, there's some bread that I eat nowadays, that once upon a time, yuck! I remember the first time when my wife introduced this um, multigrain, multigrain, come on, I taste it, I said, what is this? This ain't bread. The first time she introduced Quinoa. Don't that sound like somebody? <laughs> when she said to me, do, when she said, when she said do, you, do you know quinoa? I said, who is he? <laughs> and she cooked it and the first time I tasted it, it didn't taste good. But after that, I had it again and again, you acquired a taste. These are things that are good for your body. And what is really, 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 really good for your body? Your mouth doesn't like it. <laughs> your mouth doesn't like it. You put it in your mouth and yuck, rile, pal. And what is not good for your body? Your mouth is happy. The Holy Spirit is given to us to allow us to experience the fullness of God. Did you hear that? Do I need to repeat it? The Holy Spirit, remember the scripture, we, one of the scripture we looked at last week was 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I have it right, written down here because... In that chapter, I didn't read all the way down to the end, but this question that Brother Marlon put here, how does Christ think? Any, 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 you came in here, did you look at it? Did you think about it? How does Christ think? This is a powerful question. And I put 1 Corinthians chapter 2 because verse 16, I didn't want to put a verse. I want you to read the whole thing. But verse 16 says... We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. If we have the mind of Christ, it means that we are supposed to think like Christ. How does Christ think? How does Christ think, right? And the Holy Spirit has been given to us to bring us into that reality. I remember when I thought I had no control over my mind. When I, when I was possessed by loss, masturbation, and all these things, and I thought I had absolutely no control over my mind. And many people think they don't. 
And then I begin to pay attention to the scripture and realize that what the scripture was showing us is that we have power over our mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice let, the word let means to permit. If I am the one that is to allow, permit something to happen, it means I have control. Then the scripture also says, that's Philippians chapter 2. The scripture also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 3 going down to about verse 6, it says that the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty true God to the pulling down of strongholds. What, what are the strongholds? Casting down imaginations. Every I think that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Watch this. Bringing every thought captive to the very obedience. So God is saying you are like a police officer. You have been given authority and you have been given power. You can arrest every thought. But how do you do it? You don't just sit down like a garbage bin and any thought Satan come and inject, it just run wild like, what run wild here? Like dandelion. Our wildfire is the in thing now. But you know, I, I like dandelion. I don't like it in my garden. But I like when it grow over there. And, 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 <laughs> Yeah, I heard that it's good for your health. I heard that people eat it like vegetable. I will have to acquire the taste for it. <laughs> but if you come to my home right now, you will not find a weed in my lawn. Because there are those moments when I go out there and I'm like, matlock. <laughs> I'm serious. And sometimes some of them hide themselves between the plants, the flower that you... And I said, wait. And when you get inside there. And I just take my time and meticulously root it out. Sometimes persons ask me, how do you get rid of the weed? I said, I don't even really let them grow. <laughs> so, so I don't need to use weed be gone <laughs> I, as soon as I see them coming up I pick them out ask my wife I pick them out and so our lawn I kid you not I'm not boasting everybody on our block their eyes is on our lawn we went across the road the other day and there's uh, so a, a, a couple, I think they're from Russia or Ukraine or something like that. And they were doing something. My wife one day I went over to talk with them. And she said, oh my gosh, your lawn is so green. And it's so, what did you do? She said, ours is, you know, now that you come over from that lawn and you come over, you know, you have to defend yours. Said, ours is, you know, because we're doing all of this, why it's like that. But we're going to work on it. I didn't say anything about your lawn. But, 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 but. She said, what did you do? I said, well, I, I, I um, soil, reseed, and fertilize. She said, soil, reseed, fertilize. She said, you hear that? Soil, <laughs> reseed, and fertilize. <laughs> because a lot of people always say this. The grass is greener on the other side. But I promise you, for the grass to stay green on the other side, it takes a lot of work. And if you go over there with your lazy self, the grass is going to get brown on the other side. Take a lot of work. I'm serious. Because after we had the moles went through during the winter. So when the spring came, there was a lot of patches and stuff like that in the lawn. And then when the grass started growing back, we had a new neighbor moving. God bless his soul. I cut the lawn, so when I cut the lawn, I go straight across and cut the, the neighbor lawn. He know things that he needs to pay me back. One Saturday when I'm on fasting, he went and cut, and he cut it real low. The meeting over and I call my wife, my wife said, hon, 
I need to prepare you. I'm thinking now, what is going on here? She said, I need to prepare you before you come home. I'm thinking, what happened at home now? She said, hon, I was inside. I heard the lawnmower going, but I didn't know it was the neighbor. Cause she said, I looked through the window. And by the time I got out there, he murdered the grass. She said, I was calling out to him and he was hearing. I had to go out there and when he see me. And she said, no. She said, my husband doesn't cut the grass like that. He said, what? Then when I went, I saw where he used some of the cut grass and put in, the, in between <laughs> to cover up, to cover up the crime. <laughs> of course, I had to forgive him. I couldn't hold it against him. So now I had to go and do a little more extra work to make sure that the lawn come back. So I went through and I did what I had to do. And then about two, three weeks later, or so, maybe more than that, he came back. And he said, what did you do? <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, honest to God, we have the best lawn on the block. <laughs> and then he's saying, you know, when you cut mine, you know, I, I want to, I, I just want to, I want to return the favor. Now I'm saying, in my mind, I didn't say it to him yet. If you are saying that I am doing something good, I'm doing something right, that's why the lawn looked the way, why don't you leave it to me? Because I don't mind doing it. When you touch it, he has a red thumb. <laughs> <laughs> green thumb so I work on that lawn and when I work on it, it, it I compare it to spiritual things why I go after the weed the way I do I'm serious I see the weed as sin I will not let it grow up to even blossom and produce any seed I pluck it out I don't care how deep the root go if I have to go and get my gloves, I say, hold on there, I'm coming back. And I take my time and I, and sometimes some of them you have to, don't just grab it, because you have to shake it a little. And when you shake it, you know, it's loosening up and then you pull a little and see how far it can go. And if you need to do some more shaking, you shake and pull until you get it out. All of it, because if you leave any root in there, it's going to grow back. It's going to grow back. And that's why the Bible talks about root of bitterness springing up in you whereby many be defiled. We've got to deal with it. Man, I didn't want to talk about the receiving yet, but I want to talk about this. Look at maybe two or three scriptures and we go home. The importance of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? Say that. Who is the Holy Spirit? One more time. Who is... The Holy Spirit. If he comes through the door right now, would you know? Would you know that's the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? So what I've been doing for the past two weeks is based on what the scripture, how the scripture has introduced the Holy Spirit to us. I want us to take a little look at that and to get something here that as we move forward, we'll understand and appreciate how the Holy Spirit is meant to be and operate in our lives. So in Genesis chapter 1, the first time the scripture says anything about the Holy Spirit, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. There is, a, to a certain degree, we can take verse 2 literally, to a certain degree. But there is a metaphor to it also. That when he says the earth was without form and void, what we need to get from this and what we need to understand is that nothing was purposed yet. Nothing was placed. Nothing was positioned. And that's why it is saying it was without 
form. So nothing is in the place that it's supposed to be. And it was void. Nothing is operating and functioning the way that God intends. So if you notice now, what happens when all of this is happening? Notice what bring about a change or a difference, if you want to use it. And the Spirit of God was overing over the face of the deep. The face of the deep is not just water. God is the deep. God is the face. And notice what this, you need to see from this, is revelation. So something was hidden. Something was covered. And the Holy Spirit is the one that is now creating the atmosphere for revelation. And notice when the Spirit moved, what was the first thing that God called for? Light. light. Revelation. Because when light turns on, I can't use this room. I could use midway. I did it a couple times. We'll return off the light and the place is pitch dark. And you only see some eyes. <laughs> but if I turn off the lights here, we're going to still see each other. But light reveals things. If this room was dark and you all walk inside here, we wouldn't appreciate your clothing. Because all I'm hearing is Sister Arit and Sister Arit, is that you? Yes, it's me, Pastor. <laughs> and you wouldn't see her clothing. Now, Trisha would walk in, and you wouldn't realize that her hair match our dress. <laughs> no, I, that she has been like that all along. You know, we were watching a, a, a service Tuesday night Bible study, and Trisha was in the front. And I said to my, it was like back maybe about 26 years so I said to Nadine, I said, Trisha has been doing that for a She said, yes, ever since she came. <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't see that to recognize that that's what's going on because you're in darkness. But when light shows up, it reveals. And that's why the scripture says, everything that is done in the dark will come to the light. Whatever is done in the house is going to come up on the housetop. And the Bible said that we are the light of the world. So anybody who you run with, you're going to expose some things because you're light. You are light. And there is something about the day comparing to night. In the day, if somebody tried to stand up behind a tree to prounce upon you, you can see them. But in the night, they blend in with the dark. And if you notice, most crimes, most crimes, I'm not telling you a crime doesn't happen in the day, but most crimes take place when? So I want to look, I want to show you something. And I, I showed you, I think I did it twice, that when you see the word God in the scripture and from the very beginning, what's the two main thing that we should think of that word? What does it reveal to us? Creator and sustainer, which means whatever God creates, he sustains. What did I say? Whatever God creates, he Am I right? You sure? Yes. So after God said, let there be light, and there was light, he now made a distinction. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning was the first day. Let me look at about two more, and I'll stop. In... Genesis chapter 41, verse 36. And when I read it, I'll tell you why we need to look at these. Even if I don't go through all of these by in, in detail, 
There is 26 verses in the Old Testament that use that the word, the, the words Spirit of God occurs. 26 verses. So even if I didn't go through all of them in detail, I wanted to take the time and look at them because everywhere after Genesis chapter 1, everywhere it says Spirit of God, you see a different manifestation. But it's continued to be creator and sustainer. Are you hearing me? So in Genesis chapter 41, it says, Then that food shall be as reserved for the land for the seven years of famine. Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dream, you remember? And it said, Shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning, notice, as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, over my family, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Now, we understand where the wisdom that Joseph had came from. Where did it come from? The Spirit of God. So, as I said, the main thing, creator, sustainer. But there are other things that the Spirit of God is meant to put on display in and through your life. To support you because of who you are to God. Third one, Exodus chapter 31. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. And watch this. The Spirit of God that he is now filled with is going to manifest in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. The Holy Spirit is able to give you strategy. You don't have to. I'm, listen to me. I'm serious about the st statement I'm going to make. You don't have to go to school for everything. Unless the Spirit tells you to. Come on. The Holy Spirit is meant to support and sustain us because of who we are in God. So at this juncture, what is going on in Exodus chapter 31? When we get to Exodus chapter 25, before that, in Exodus chapter 19, after they came out of Egypt, about three months later, God told Moses to bring the children to the mount. Moses himself was supposed to come up to God and God would speak to him. The intent that God had in mind when he told Moses to sanctify the people and bring them to the mount was to introduce himself to them. You remember when God introduced himself, what happened? There was manifestation of fire, there was thundering, there was lightning, and there was smoke. So what happened? The people were afraid. The next day that they're supposed to go up, they said to Moses, we like God, but <laughs> we're afraid of him. So you know what we're going to ask you to do, Moses? You go. You go. Go, go up there. Go up. And whatever I tell you, come back down here and tell us and we will believe you. Moses went up and said, he said, God, because the Moses is the only man until we get to the New Testament. The only man in the, under the Old Testament, apart from Adam, that God spoke to face to face. He never spoke to Moses through dreams and vision. Moses never had a dream or a vision. 
any time and every time that God spoke to Moses, it was face to face. Wow. <laughs> and so now, when Moses brought the message to God as if God didn't know, God said, the people have well spoken. He said, this is what you're now going to do in Exodus chapter 25. That's why this was introduced. That's why the tabernacle came into being. Because it was never God's intent to have any tabernacle. God himself would just tabernacle among them, deal with them, talk with them, but they were afraid of him. So he said, now build me a tabernacle. The fence of the tabernacle was high where they couldn't see over there. Only the priests could enter in and function inside. So now when it was supposed to be, be built, God didn't allow them to build and come up with their own idea. God says, I'm going to fill this individual with my spirit. And he's going to have the wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and all manner of workmanship. And design artistic works to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, and in cutting of jewelry, for setting and carving wood, and work in all manner of workmanship. And I, God indeed, I have appointed him with, with him, Oli, Olobia. Olobia. <laughs> you know the guy, right? <laughs> Out of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, and that they may make all that I have commanded you. So when God called you, and whatever God wants you to do, God does not want you to get any wisdom from the world. Wisdom from man is going to contaminate and that's why we have a contaminated, corrupt, hypocritical church today. Because most of what we're doing in church, it's come from the world. It's not guided by the Spirit. And the people in the world, do you think that the people in the world is coming in the church to get things from the world? No, they are already in the world. They, they may not know it, even people that you invite today. They may not know that they want something else. But let me tell you something, they do. And when they come into the church, they must say the same thing. The same kind of jigging and the same kind of music. And and we call the church. And they come and they say, oh, I have better than that. You think is that going to bring them in? You think is that's going to keep them? So some pastors say, we need to have the music, we need to have the singing, we need to have the... No, we need something more than that. Jesus didn't bring singing to us. He didn't bring music. He brought the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory as of the only. Because man shall not live by bread alone. They don't need music. Let the music play. But then after the music finish play, you commit suicide. <sighs> Tina Turner, the queen of, what was it the queen, she queen the queen of what? Pop? Rock? <laughs> well, put it, put it. The queen, she, it was rock? It was rock. I did not know until when she died a few weeks back. Because when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, and I heard about Tina Turner, and I was saying to my wife the other day, I said, did you know that the, my favorite Tina Turner song was, What love got to do with it, got to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you said the long legs who need the heart when the heart can be <laughs> but a second and emotion hey <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know that she had a rough time Growing up, then when she married to this guy that she was in, I never even heard of that guy until she died. I literally Google 
I, I Google, yeah, I, I didn't know anything about him. So he, I didn't know that her Turner name was actually her married name. And it was Ike Turner, her husband, who actually gave her the name Tina. Because that's not her birth name. And she kept it. But even after she ran away from him, because he was very abusive. So when she was singing what love got to do with it, she was talking about what she had experienced. She said, it, it, who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? And it was a second hand emotion. And she, watch this, she practiced the religion called Buddhism. She was a Buddhist. I'm saying there are things that they want and they don't even know that they want it. Because being a Buddhist, what do you think that does for you? She died. Where is she now? If she didn't know the Lord Jesus. You think Buddha is helping her right now? Buddha? Buddha need help. Look at his belly. serious no offense person but listen truth is truth and i'm here to, i am here to say nothing but the truth and to live in accordance with it it may hurt but only truth sets you free and she gets so many awards so many this but yet she was a hurting broken person i look at um the one that was the queen of soul Rita Franklin, we're going riding, we're going riding on the freeway, and we need a pink Cadillac. She was the one who taught us how to spell if we didn't get. <laughs> her father was a pastor, her father raped her. When you hear me talking against pastor, you better shut your mouth and say, the nastiness that is going on in the church, and a lot of you know it. And the reason why a lot of people, when they hear about the church, they're sick to their stomach. And we need, they need, they need to know that everybody is not the same. That even one of us, there's, come on, there's a David, there's a, there's a Elijah, there's a Joshua, there's a Gideon, there's a Esther, there's a Barak. There's a Deborah. We're not all the same. Her father, who is a pastor, raped her. Her first child that she had was for her father. He destroyed her life for, until the day she died. Why she became an alcoholic? Because in, in spite of the fame, in spite of the popularity. Because, you know, after she come on and then she begin to teach us how to spell R-E-S-P. Hey, tell me what it means to me. <laughs> And we watched her as she get older. We saw bits, we begin to see certain things. She gained weight. I, I, how can you stay in that world of darkness? Did you know that Luther Van Dross struggled with food? If you notice, sometimes he was really huge. And there was another time you see him come down because he, he because based on what he's going to, he tried to take off some of the weight and then another time you see And he died mysteriously. Luther Von Dross with that, with that golden voice. Don't let me talk about Whitney. The world out there, it's darkness. And all of them have fame and popularity in darkness. Beyonce. And you are a preacher talk about Beyonce is their friend. Beyonce needs God. Amen. Really need God. Yes. All of them. If you ever go back and look at the history of our lot of the entertainers, the musicians, name them. If you look at how they die, you know. That it's a dark world out there. And us as the church, we're playing. And many of us even envy them for what they have. I envy none of them. None. Sister Arpeg, you believe me? 
I pity them. I pity them. Hear this. Three cars were built by Rolls Royce. Only three. It's known as the boat tail Rolls Royce. The back, you press a button and it opens up and there's a thing like, like a sail, like a boat. And it have cutleries, glass, and everything designed for you if you want to go on a picnic and all of that. Do you know how much one of the car costs? 28 million US dollars. 28. 28 million. Three of them they made. And that's why they're so expensive. You know who purchased one? Beyonce and her husband. The second one, the guy who sing happy. You know happy? That's why he's so happy. <laughs> they played that song in church. Right? It shows you the state of the church. The third one, it's an unknown buyer from the Middle East that purchased it. $28 million. And I'm here to tell you that they may think that they have money. But let me tell you something. Having all the money in this world and don't have Christ, you have nothing. Because they say you've got to be, listen, they, they said if you're somebody, you've got to drive a Ferrari. If you're somebody, you've got to have at least even one Rolls Royce in your garage. If you're somebody, you've got to have a Bentley. So you're going to tell me that I'm nobody because I don't even have the rim. I can't, I can't even buy the rim of a, of, a, of, a, of a whatever. And I'm telling you, I'm serious. I envy them not. I pity them every day because I see how they end. The Bible says, mark a righteous man because the end of that man is peace. Because do you know what they did to get the wealth that they have? They made a deal with the devil. And when you make a deal with him, he's going to collect. And what he wants to collect is not your money. It's not your fame. It's not your power. It's your soul. And Jesus said, what shall it profit a man? To gain the whole world and lose his own soul. If you know Christ, because I'm serious, a lot of us as believers, we are being tempted with, and the devil caused us to be looking. And we, we see even some of our friends that we used to go to school with them. And we were brighter than them in the class. And we had, we, 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 we had more smarts than them. And today, they're driving past you, dusting you up in the air, Bentley. And they stop and they say, hi, how are you? I haven't seen you in a while. I heard that you've gone to church and you're a Christian. Yes, I am. All right. Boom, boom. I'll see you tomorrow. They say, oh, my God. No, you don't. If you do that, you don't know God. It's not the amount of things that you own in this life that gives you value. I say, let me say it again. It's not what you own in this life gives you value. Because remember, you came in. What did, did, did you come in here with no gold teeth? Have you ever seen a baby born with gold? And when the baby cry, gold teeth? No, you came in naked. They came in without teeth. And you leave without teeth. The Bible said, naked you came, naked you go. 
even if they bury you in a Bentley or a Rolls Royce. Because it's even in Africa, they're burying people in Mercedes Benz. What garbage, what nonsense. If I was living close there, I would go and take the body out and drive home the Benz. It is of no value. When you die, you, nothing that they bury you with. I was doing a funeral in Jamaica, and the guy was a, a street guy, you know, involving guns and gangs and stuff like that. And I was the one that was committing, doing the funeral. And boy, I found out that the very moment, on the day of the, of the funeral, there was, there was a, 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 what do you call it, a turf war. So on one side, of the, inside of the church building, there were some people sitting, and there were some, and they wouldn't cross the aisle. And I said... And I watched them, I see. I said, they don't know who is in charge of this thing. We get to the graveside, and they were smoking ganja, and they were put ganja in a casket, and they were put money, and they were put all kinds of stuff. I said, watch here. Every one of you wear smoke the ganja right now. Put it out! Want to think on the bad? Eh, eh. And them keep on doing some stuff. Me say, stop it. Me say, and me, I commit this body. Me say, if one of you put nothing more in there, me walk away. And me want to see you commit the body to the earth. Everybody start dress back. And me say, oh, what kind of pastor this? <laughs> <laughs> and I begin to, I, I say, I want to talk to all of you because I say, I'm not here to talk to the dead. I say, you think that what you're putting in this casket is, you, th you think that after we leave here, he's going to make a spliff later and smoke something? He's dead. Me, I lick the casket. Me say, in dead. <laughs> I say, you need to learn from even his life and the way how he lived. Look at how he died. Shot down by police officers. The atmosphere change. All the ganja smoke. We didn't have to get no firefighter to come from Africa. <laughs> Disappear. But the Spirit of God is given to us for us to understand who we are in God and live in the fullness of God. And living that way, you don't need a big bank account. You don't need to have things hoard up. He promised to supply our daily needs. In the book of Exodus chapter 16, um, children of Israel came out of Egypt. They've been in Egypt for 400 years of bondage and slavery. As slaves, they were totally dependent on their slave masters to provide for them. So if they don't give them anything, they don't have anything. And it's whatever they give them, that's what they have. So after they left Egypt, they leave out of Egypt with the slave mentality that they had to defend, they had to fend for themselves. And God wanted to change their mindset to let them know that you don't function like the world. Because in order for the world to feel secure, they need to see things hoard up. In order for them to have any sense of security, they need to see things. And so Israel, God testing them. He said, Moses, tomorrow I am going to bring this. And this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to let bread fall from heaven. First, the dew is going to fall in the ground, which represents the Holy Spirit. The presence of God would show up first, then the bread would follow. And God says, when they go out in the morning, they must only take up what is enough for each family daily. You remember what they did the first day? They didn't only go and take up what they should. 
they bring drum, they bring bucket, and they fool it. They say, me no know what God goes to do because tomorrow morning, me might wake up and no food no day. So me want to make sure me have something for eat tomorrow. And when they wake up in the morning, you remember what the scripture said? God let worm take it up. What is God saying? You need to trust me. You know even why some of us are going through some things right now, the way things are working? God himself is actually allowing something because we're not trusting him. The way we think and the way we behave. We get money, we don't even want to spend it because we think that if we spend it, we're not going to get no more. You are no longer in Egypt. When we got terminated last year from our job, because remember, I know I am volunteering. <laughs> I am not getting a weekly or monthly salary. So when we got terminated, here my wife, you know, she mean well, of course, and I understand where she's coming from. She's, she's saying, hon, we're going to have to cut back and we're going to have to do. I said, woman. No cutting back. I said, I know that was not our source. God is our source. We're going to live. We're going to live as we were before. I asked her. And we are helping other people. And we're giving to people. We're sending to people. And we are blessing other people. Without a salary. Because when God is your source. He's Jehovah. Is Jehovah Jireh, the many breasted one? There is one breast for you, one breast for you, because remember, he's sustainer. And from last year until now, bills are being paid. The hydro bill, I set up, I set up on the online thing with the hydro. With um, the, the electrical company, the gas company, the, the water, all of them set up online in a checking account. And sometimes my wife says, it's, it's, it's low, it's on the threshold. That if this one take out, it will go gone over into it. And you know, said so the bank, once you go over the threshold, then they murder you with the fee. Overdraw fee and underdraw fee and no draw fee. And you should have drawn, but you didn't draw, so we're going to charge you. And all of those bills are taken care of every time. And we're eating, and we're drinking, and we're dancing. Oh my God. Because I, God is using us to let Satan know you are a liar and you're a loser. And God is also using our life as an example to encourage some of you for you to understand that your job is not your source. What they told you is your source. It's a lie. God is your source. And when you make God your source, one door closes and God opens. I'm not going to go into detail, but there was a sister that had a need for certain things. And she sent and said, I said, how much is it? She said, I said, send me your email. And I was able to send heat transfer. Another brother reached out sometime back and he said, da, da, da. I said, how much is it need? And he told me, and I gave him more than what he said he needed. Now, notice, you, know, you got to understand this, that if you're waiting to have an amount before you give, <laughs> you're going to die. <laughs> And watch this, people that is always saying, oh, I, I'm waiting until when I win the lotto marks. <laughs> I'll bless you. Don't, don't, don't rely on them. Because if you don't have the mind to give out of what you have now, who say that when you win the lotto marks? You are going... The lady, they, they heard a story, I don't know who it is, but in Jamaica the lady said, and this will be my last one. 
the lady, it, it says, she said, you know, they said she go into the church and, you know, these nominal church and stuff like that. And, said, and the pastor was riding his bicycle. So he had to, you know, every Sunday ride his bicycle to church. And she said, Pastor, if the Lord ever bless me, I'm going to buy you a car. Every Sunday she said, Pastor, she told Pastor the same story. And the scripture said that, the, the scripture, <laughs> <laughs> the time came where she came into some money, some inheritance or something like that. So after that, she don't say anything to the pastor. So one day the pastor approached her and the pastor said, sister, so-and-so, you remember, you'd always say to me, you know, if you, if you have any, you know, the money, God bless you, so you did help me with a car. She said, pastor, when I didn't have the money, I had the mind. <laughs> but now that I have the money, I don't have that mind anymore. You see a person that is a true giver, they give you out of their nothing. And did you know that giving is a gift of the spirit? Romans chapter 12. Giving is a gift. So there, every single one of us has some gift from the spirit that God intends to put himself on display through you. That you see the giver? They will take the shirt off their back and give it to you. You have to say to them, no, 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 no. If you give me that, they say, no, no, you take it. And I'm saying that we need to really know our God in these days. That he's a creator and he's sustainer. And that the job is not your source. And you are going to believe, you're going to stand on God's word and know that you can have a mortgage free house. You can have a car without a loan. Huh? A lot of what? With a whole lot of horses behind you. Oh my God almighty sister. <laughs> With 400 horsepower. Hmm? We've got to believe that. Yes. When God gave me my car in Jamaica, and I was going up to, I was living in the town of Port Antonio at that time, and I was going up to this place that they call Fairy Hill. It's where they have the Baston Jerk, um, the original Baston Jerk. Anywhere else you go and see, it's a fake Baston Jerk, counterfeit. And I was going up, and I picked up this gentleman in the car, you know, he was booming a ride and I picked him up, came in and he started talking to me. So he had heard me sharing the testimony because I had the, I was on the cable um, channel and I had my programs on a Tuesday night. So I went on and I remember sharing the testimony and they record that and repeat it. So he said, I heard you talking about God give you a car. So he come inside, inside, tell me the truth. I'm here, you alone in it. I and you, we're alone inside here. Tell me the truth. How much you have leave to pay on the car? I turn around and I look at him and say, listen to me. You think I'm a liar? I said, I don't know how much the car cost. And I don't owe anything else on it. God gave it to me. I say, if you don't want to believe it, you want me to stop and let you out? <laughs> or you couldn't be in my car where God gave me and I try to convince me that he didn't give it to me. Hmm? God gave me. That car at that time in 2001 was over 500 and something thousand Jamaican dollars. Over half a million dollars. And as I told you, the sister that the Lord spoke to, to gave me that car, she took me to the insurance. She insured it. She took me to the revenue, inland revenue. They licensed it, do everything. And I drove that car away without thinking about anything. And there are many of us who, do, people here do, did not believe what we testify and share about God giving us certain things. They said, no, that cannot be. Because you see, you have been an hustler all your life. And you're still hustling. And if you don't repent, you will hustle till you go to the grave and never have anything. Listen to me. God didn't save you. He saved you from a life of hustling. Amen. You're not a peddler. You're a son of God. Amen. Was Jesus here peddling? No. And when there was a need, what did he do? Marlon, may I stop? But my God, 
When Jesus had a need, what did he do? How does Christ think? He knew in the first place that God was his source. You notice on many occasions when he was praying what the scripture said, he lifted his eyes up to his source. He knew where his help was coming from. And I'm saying to you again one more time in this meeting, many of us have been carrying certain burden of stress that we don't have to. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, What peace we often forfeit. Why? All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Everything to God in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. The life around us, the world around us, it is imperfect. It is broken. Father, there are so many of us that we have this pretense of this facade on the outside. We have a nice hairstyle. The nails are welled, manicured. Our skins are well taken care of because we've been to the spa. But inside, we are crying. We're broken. We're crying out for help. Can anyone hear me? Father, there are people in this room today like that. Father, they have a choice. Many may choose to walk out and leave broken, carrying the burden that they have been carrying for a long time now. Because Father, I know that People who commit suicide, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it, it, it starts somewhere and it builds and it builds and it builds. And there's a, there's, a, there's a shame that the enemy brings over them. That they think that if I talk about my problem, if I talk about my situation, people are going to think this and people are going to say this and people are going to look at me differently. And they're dying on the inside. But Father, today, there is a healer in this room there is a deliverer in this room there is a burden bearer carrier in this room that we can cast our cares upon because he cares for us and we don't have to carry our burdens anymore we don't have to carry the pain. We don't have to carry the earth. We don't have to carry the lie. We don't have to live to impress people and trying to compare ourselves and living up to the expectation of another person. While I am dying on the inside, I can be free. I can be free. I can be free as a child without any care. I can be free. Chasing after birds, chasing after butterflies, chasing after certain things without any care in this world. That's how God wants you to see yourself being in him. Carefree. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. I did not preach long. You remember what time I started preaching? <laughs> we had a lot of stuff to talk about, testimonies to share and things to do. Well, it was a beautiful weekend. Beautiful weekend. Beautiful weekend. 
There was a lot of talk about us yesterday at the, at the center. People were saying they had never seen a baptism like that before. There, there was a brother that was talking to me and said, he said there was a lady that was, she said, I'm Catholic. And I've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> and the manager they said was talking about the baptism also. I don't know if she's a believer, but she said, I've never seen it. This is different. Say, so, yeah, we're the strange ones. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. It was beautiful. You remember one of the lifeguard? She talked about the baptism and she said, not the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But baptism in water. And I said to my wife that she knows something about the Bible or she grew up around people that goes to church. But it really had an impact on people around. When we were going around to the changing room, there was a lady standing, I believe maybe it was her husband. They're Indians. And she said, I met some nice, lovely people a while ago. They're going to get baptized. <laughs> and she was talking with excitement like she wanted to join them, you know. <laughs> but, it, but we had an impact there. We had an impact there. I don't know if we'll go back there by the next time around. But I'm saying to you, let us continue to open ourselves to God because people need as I said, they may not know, and they may not say, and they may not ask, but we be the light and give them hope. Give them hope. I bless you. I love you. I love you. And it's really good to see you and to be among you another time. When we're apart, you know, it's like Sunday is so far away. And it shows that there is something, there's a kindred spirit. And so I commit you, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace throughout the rest of the week. And I'm decreeing that you're not only going to have an unusual week, but you're going to have a strange week. Strange things are happening. I have never watched it, but I heard the title of a show that is on Netflix that is called Stranger Things. <laughs> and I'm saying to you, Netflix got that title from God. <laughs> so you and I go through this week on purpose, every day on purpose, wake up and say, God, I'm expecting something strange today. So you're not surprised when it happened, right? And leave, watch this. Even if you're leaving your home to go out, go expecting, anticipating something strange to happen. Amen? Amen. So I'm waiting for your testimony. Amen. I'm putting a demand on you. Amen. I love you. I bless you. And it's a long time I haven't asked you to do this. So turn to the person beside you on the left and the right way and you're in front of you. Give them a hug and tell them this is from pastor. God's willing, I will see you on Sunday. <laughs> Bless you. Love you. <laughs> all week, all week. Yes. Had a blockage. Yeah. I feel a difference already. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Bless you. Lord. Bless you. Love you.